um, participating and uh, collaborating with open knowledge and agricultural development collection, uh, which so should have uh, this and the full advisory board confirmed by the end of this month. Um, but yes, no, it's all looking very exciting. Uh, so invited to talk about F1000 research and about its unique publishing model and about our approach to science publishing. Oh. Uh, so a few things that research does differently to traditional uh, um, so the first is our near immediate publication model which um, which is typically means that we can publish within about 10 days of uh, from when the author has submitted although it's typically uh, can be quite a lot sooner than that. so our record is is 34 hours at the moment um, and the reason why we can publish so quickly is because we operate this post-publication peer review model. So essentially that means that, so once a manuscript is submitted to us, uh, after some in-house editorial checks to make sure that the paper uh, looks of good scientific quality, we publish it and then we invite the peer reviewers. And all this, and the peer reviewing is entirely transparent, so it's completely open, so everything the peer review report, you can see who is um, the author of the peer review report. Um, another feature of our model is that we uh, insist that all data underlying all research is um, submitted published alongside the final article. So the data is completely open, it's published under a CC0 license. Um, so it's so there's very, very limited uh, restrictions. Oh well actually there's no restrictions on reuse um, at all. And we also accept non-traditional article types, which I'll go on and discuss in a little bit more detail later. Uh, so yes, all in all we are uh, um, we're essentially the first Comprehensively open science published by anyone or operating within the life sciences. And so that ranges from uh, biomed all the way through to uh, agriculture and agricultural development, which is uh, obviously what's going to be the subject of the Open Agricultural Development Collection. So just a little bit uh, so we are the latest uh, publication uh, from, a, from a publisher which has already, already released the following two, um, uh, two headings, so Biomed Central, which was the first open access journal which was um, launched in 2000, and also the current opinion journals. Um, so F1000 Research is a part of the Faculty of 1000, which has 6,000 eminent who are affiliated uh, with it. Uh, about 1,300 of these scientists are also members of our uh, advisory board, and these include Nobel Prize winners. Prominent members of the open community. So, before I move on to the open science publishing aspect of F1000, first uh, our, our post publication peer review. Uh, this is one of our most unique aspects as a, as a um, publishing platform. So, On this slide, you can see the typical model operated by most traditional journals, whether they're uh, 
subscription journals or whether they're open access journals. So essentially an article is submitted, then it goes through uh, several rounds of peer review, and then it either gets rejected or accepted. So even if the article gets accepted, it can still take many months for the article to be published, so when you calculate it from submission. Um, and the reason why it takes so long is because peer review is the very limiting step. Uh, it's very, very hard to organize peer review quickly because peer reviewers are incredibly busy people and they have research grants to write and they have uh, papers to write themselves and research to do themselves. And also in this, uh, in our modern scientific world, uh, everything's becoming a lot more interdisciplinary, uh, which means that the pool of available peer, um, peer reviewers is actually shrinking because there's less and less of people who are actually experts within these interdisciplinary topics. Um, and so it's really, really difficult to try and get peer review quickly, which means that um, research is usually old, many, many months, and sometimes even years old by the time it's actually published and accessible to the wider community. So what we do at F1000 Research is essentially turn this model on its head. We, we flip it around. And so where peer review happens after publication, So, and you see the rounds of peer review occurring. Uh, this happens after publication. This means uh, you can get the um, article out there and accessible to the uh, research community in a very, very short amount of time. So, in a matter of days, um, which allows experts to use this um, use this research and build upon it quickly. Um, and what those who are non-experts can wait until the peer review has actually been completed. Um, so this this is incredibly important in disciplines uh, which have real-world impacts, such as uh, biomedical research and agricultural research. The findings are actually going to have a real-world on real people. So, essentially what this post-publication peer review model is, is the benefits of a preprint server with the benefits of an open access journal and combining these onto a single open platform. Just like a preprint server, people have early access to the results and data and can reuse it from the get-go. Um, from the author's point of view, the ability to publish very quickly allows the authors to claim precedence for their research, which is really important because authors, um, authors put a lot of value on reputation and uh, reputation for being the first to discover X, Y, or Z. And also like a preprint server, um, articles aren't necessarily finished products. They're, they're always in a state of flux, just just like um, science actually is. So uh, authors are allowed to continually update their manuscripts as they get new findings or in um, to correct. Uh, to perform corrections that peer reviewers have asked for, um, or anything they want to, really. If they do a follow-up study, they can then create a new new version. But just like an open access journal, uh, F1000 Research provides editorial input, um, provides some copy editing service, it provides, it makes sure that the final article um, has enough information for it to be properly peer reviewed and properly um, and to make use of all the information, make sure enough of the methodology has been written down for people to actually make use of this, uh, of, of the research in question. Uh, we also handle the publication ethics side of things, so if there's any uh, author disputes or uh, open data issues, we, we will handle that. And uh, finally, the perfected paper is always going to be open access. So that's one of the, uh, the limitations of preprint servers 
is that what can often happen is that the author will deposit uh, an article within the preprint and then uh, put the final uh, perfected uh, article into a traditional journal. And so the journals don't always have access to the uh, to the final version. And also, ask, uh, authors can also keep track of articles, um, and so that they're always alerted to uh, to whenever a peer review comes in or whenever a new version uh, has been submitted and published. So that's our post-publication peer review model. So now moving on to our open science publishing approach. So the top the, the definition of open science provided by the Open Knowledge Foundation's Open Science Working Group. And the focus of this is mainly on freedom to use, reuse, and distribute uh, without legal, technological, social restrictions, uh, scientific knowledge products. And so this is, this is uh, perfect for uh, trying to make sure that articles are openly available and being able to reuse and distribute. Um, but with the other knowledge products listed here, such as referee reports, data, software, um, we haven't necessarily got to um, the level of publishing it in the first place. It hasn't even got a platform on which to publish. So what F1000 Research is doing is that we're providing a platform to enable these, uh, these different knowledge products to be published. And then, in addition, making sure that uh, these products are free to use, both and to reuse and distribute, both uh, financially and also in terms of licensing. Um, so our articles are always CC by, our referee reports are always CC by, our data is by default CC zero, but we do accept other uh, Creative uh, Commons licenses for that. Software is normally uh, published under a Creative Commons license. And the same with the non-traditional research outputs. Those are CC BY as well. So the first knowledge product I'll discuss is uh, peer review reports, which when we're talking about open science, uh, this is usually the, um, the knowledge product which is not talked about so much. There's more focus on open data and open software. But it's, we believe it's important to make peer review open as well. So there's some, there's some general issues with traditional closed peer review systems, which include lack of accountability. So because referees are almost always anonymous, it means that there's no accountability for the quality of their peer review. So even though lots of peer reviewers do excellent jobs in, um, in uh, critiquing certain papers, if they do hand in a sloppy report or an insulting report, uh, that's not going to impact on their reputation at all because everything is closed and anonymous. Uh, there's also issues with uh, transparency. So we have no, no idea in closed peer review systems how many journals that an article has gone through and how many rejections it's had until before being published in another journal. Uh, and this is also an incredibly inefficient way of doing things because uh, an article will often be re-reviewed multiple times, uh, which considering the modern day issue with peer review burdens, this is a major contributor, is the fact that reviewers often ask to review and re-review for separate journals for exactly the same article. And so this causes, as I mentioned before, uh, potentially very long delays, which can be incidental, um, but also can be deliberate because quite often uh, the reviewers can be competitors to um, to the authors, and so there there have been instances of uh, foul play by reviewers. And so, what should an open peer review system look like? So this is one option. Um, but unlikely to be widely accepted. But this is the way we do it. So what we do is that we publish the referee reports and append them to the end of the research article. 
and we make sure that the referee uh, report has, is named, so you can see the person's, uh, you can see their full name of the reviewer, you can see their institution, and um, and in addition, you can see uh, the impact of this review. So we measure the reviews, but we also make sure that the referee is citable. The referee reports are citable. So we assign each referee report a DOI, which means that it's trackable and also can be cited as a knowledge product in its own right. And so this is important in terms of giving credit for reviewers and incentivizing open peer review. So just quickly, these are some of the benefits of open peer review. So for readers, um, reviews by expert individuals means that the paper is put into context and the strengths and limitations are outlined and open to all. Uh, it can actually also reduce bias among reviewers because of the social pressure for objectivity. Scientists are very concerned about their reputations and so when they're writing a peer review report, they know that all their peers are going to be potentially reading this report and um, will be sensitive to picking out potential conflicts of interest or um, poor peer, peer reviewing standards. So the fact that everything is open acts as an additional social pressure for um, referees to um, provide more constructive and better quality reviews. So uh, in addition, published reports can keep can help teach young researchers how to peer review correctly. And also proves that peer review has actually been conducted. So some of you have heard about the Bohannon sting, uh, where a um, man called John Bohannon submitted uh, a fake article to various journals and lots of them were published, uh, or accepted for publication, and this was thought to be due down to the fact of either very sloppy peer reviewing or the fact that peer review hadn't actually been done at all. But in a closed system, there's no way of telling this. And there's also benefits for reviewers, uh, such as uh, displaying to their peers that they know what they're talking about, and also gaining credit um, through having a, uh, having a citable uh, referee report. So we ask our referees to judge our articles um, purely based on their scientific quality, not on their impact or novelty. So we're a bit like uh, plots in that respect. And uh, we ask them to assign one of these three statuses. Uh, so just a note that um, not approved does not equal reject. Uh, this is a common question we get. So because the article has already been published, if an article gets um, not approved statuses, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, the authors can then publish their results elsewhere. Because it's already published, where we, we, um, it's, they're not allowed to essentially go and publish with another journal. And um, so the idea behind that is because uh, if it's poor science, then it should be, everybody should be able to see that it's poor science and not go to another journal where it can then be um, published and then people who are less uh, familiar or less uh, have less degree of expertise in that subject um, won't necessarily be able to pick out those limitations. So basically in this model, peer reviewers uh, don't determine publication, they determine wider dissemination. So the power of the peer reviewers under this model is on whether an article gets indexed or not. And so indexing requires at least two approved statuses or one approved and two approved with reservations. And also just to mention that uh, the open reviews that we get, regardless of the status that they've been given, are always respectful and always incredibly constructive. So what happens if an article doesn't get uh, or doesn't pass peer review first time around? Well, the authors have the ability to make changes to their manuscript and submit a new version addressing the peer reviewer's concerns. And so each version gets assigned its own DOI, which you can see at the bottom. And you can also track how many different versions there are. So if you click on that cross marks uh, sign, you should be able to see uh, 
the different uh, versions of the article. It's, it's versioning history. Um, and versioning can also be used, uh, it, well, it's, it can be particularly useful for um, publishing software papers, which I'll go on to talk about in a second. Uh, so whenever there's an update for a software article, the authors can then release a new, um, a new version which is up to date with the latest version of the software. So, if uh, somebody comes across a, um, uh, a ver uh, let's say the first version of the article, but a new version has been published in the meantime, if that person clicks on the DOI, uh, they'll be brought to the first version, but they will also be notified that a newer version of the article is available. And then they can either choose to stick with the version 1 or go to the latest version. So publishing open data and open software. So our approach to publishing data is to integrate it within the article, within the research article. And so, all, so with all research articles, it's mandatory for the authors to submit their data alongside their manuscript. And if they don't submit it, this is grounds for rejection. Um, so the data sets we publish are embedded uh, within the, um, the article, although we do allow uh, authors to submit the, uh, deposit their data in accredited repositories. Uh, the data have their own DOIs um, and so are independently citable um, and also just to mention quickly that we, we publish uh, a type of article called a data article which is essentially like a research article, but without any analysis or conclusions. So that's just where um, the paper is comprised of methods which we use to obtain that data, as well as the raw data set. And so this is useful for people who want to deposit very large data sets and who want to use that as a centralized base from which to publish multiple subsequent articles, but also small data sets which aren't going to be published, into, uh, which the authors aren't going to use to publish a full article. We encourage our, uh, authors to publish their, um, their small data sets so that they're out in the open and could potentially be reused. So data notes is one way of doing that. So these are some of the benefits of integrating data within articles. So this diagram is from a, uh, an article that we published, which I strongly recommend reading, uh, although we just got the, the latest submission in today, so um, maybe catch up in a few days when it should be published. Um, so essentially what this diagram shows is some of the features which you kind of expect um, from a scholarly product to be defined as being published. And so when depositing in a, in a repository, Sort of the, the feature on the left and the feature in the middle are, are fulfilled. So depositing the repository makes the data available, which is fantastic. And um, if it's a good repository, it will assign a permanent identify, uh, identifier, which allows it to be citable, which is great. But what many repositories don't do is uh, validate that uh, data. And essentially, that's what we do with the data we publish, is that we ask our peer reviewers to, um, to look at the data and make sure that everything looks okay, that it's reusable, that it doesn't look like there's any mistakes or any fiddling that's been going on. Um, and also just to mention that some of the benefits in publishing data alongside the article is because it's associated with the article, it can then uh, piggyback on the article when that article gets indexed uh, in the various bibli bibliographic databases. And so you can a uh, long better visibility that way. So that's one side of the story. We are mandating authors to publish their data alongside their, uh, their articles, uh, but we also want to encourage um, uh, readers and users to reuse and interact with this data. So we've been de developing tools to allow users to do so. So the first one that we developed is uh, the data plotter, which allows 
uh, readers and referees to um, replot the raw data within within an article and they can include anomalies um, or they can include anomalies or replot different variables. At the moment we can only do this with continuous data but we're working to do so with categorical data. Uh, we recently just published um, an article with a figure where you can interact with the data by uh, redefining some of the parameters and then replotting the figure. And in that same article we've also uh, became the first journal to publish uh, a, a real living figure, which is where uh, data from several laboratories, when it's submitted, uh, is fed in automatically into this figure, and so it'll continuously update as new data is submitted. Um, and then once this is finalized, which should be in December of this year, uh, you'll be able to uh, flick through the difference, uh, the history of this figure, so you can see what data sets were contributed and when. Um, so we also publish software papers and the advantages of doing so are similar to the advantages of publishing data papers. So this allows authors to get credit for their software tools. Um, it allows them to provide incredibly detailed documentation to allow users to use it properly as well as providing case examples uh, to illustrate how their software can be used. And because um, software papers can also be indexed in the bibliographic databases, they, um, they can also be made um, to be very highly visible. Uh, so some of the considerations we have in publishing software is that there's this tension between uh, archiving and making uh, the software permanently available on the one hand, and on the other hand we have the issue of wanting to make sure that this uh, sort of we use and built upon to create new new software products. And so at the end of each software paper we publish, we have this sort of section uh, where you can see the links to where, uh, where either the latest source code version is or where the archive is. Um, we, uh, uh, deposit the latest source code or get the authors to deposit the latest source code in version control systems such as uh, GitHub, where you can see it at the top, whilst our archiving we do through um, CERN's repository called Zenodo. So we have these other features. So I've talked about uh, software tools and data notes. We also publish uh, negative results. So um, journals have, often have been recently been criticized for focusing on publishing positive results and results that are that show significance, which can end up biasing the publication record. And so we're encouraging authors to submit and to publish uh, results which uh, are negative or null. We also publish articles which may be of particular use to those in the um, ecological and agricultural research communities. Uh, so for articles which document uh, rare ecological events or contingencies, um, especially those that might impact on agriculture, uh, agricultural practices. So one example uh, is a paper that we published by uh, Boero et al, um, which documented this very rare occurrence of these jellyfish-like uh, organisms called salps which, um, uh, which their populations exploded in 2013 and um, which might possibly uh, interact with um, some commercially important fish, uh, fish populations and if this sort of uh, rare ecological event wasn't documented then uh, fishery scientists might end up seeing uh, inconsistencies uh, and ambiguities in their um, uh, in their fish in, in the um, in fish recruitment or fish population demogra demographics at a, at a later date, and yet not be able to link it to a particular event because it would never have been documented in the first place. Uh, so we're also publishing article collections. So we talked about the Open Knowledge and Agricultural Development Collection. 
which we're very excited about collaborating with CRD and other people in order to launch. Um, these article collections can be continuously updated and tracked. And I was also asked to just mention about our business model. Uh, so we are a gold open access publisher. Um, papers generally fall into these three uh, article processing charge categories, uh, depending on article type. Uh, but we do have lots of discounts and waivers that are either permanent or that we run at any given time. Uh, so all subsequent versions of a, of a paper are always free of charge. Uh, anybody from agora listed countries get either a full or partial waiver, depending on whether they're in Group B or Group A countries. And uh, one for those in agricultural development to note is that we are waiving article processing charges for anything to do with science publishing, education, and communications. Those involves anything to do with um, uh, open knowledge activities for the entirety of 2014, and we're also providing a uh, a full waiver for articles that come out of the uh, the next GoDan me meeting, which I believe should be happening in February 2015. So I'll just leave you with uh, a summary slide that summarizes uh, essentially what F1000 research is about.